Well, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to uh, welcome you this morning to a very special Sunday morning service, a missions service. And uh, we are so pleased to have a man in uh, just a little while come and share this morning from a mission that we, uh, we take delight in, in supporting by prayer and by giving. And he's come up about a thousand miles from home, uh, just and still in the province of Ontario. But he's here this morning. You'll hear more about him in just a little while. But we're going to sing an opening hymn, and if it wasn't for, um, let's see, our Arabella Catherine Hankey, we would not be singing this hymn this morning. Lovely Christian young girl, when she was just uh, 18, she led a Bible study to some factory workers out of London, and before that she taught Sunday school. And then when she was 30, the doctor told her that uh, she had to be in bed for a whole year because she was quite ill be in bed for a whole year. And while she was in bed for that whole year, she wrote a poem, a hundred stanzas, a hundred stanz, stanza poem. And the first half of the poem had to do with a story that wa was wanted. And the last half of the poem was a story that was told. There's a gentleman a number of years later after the poem was out, he found it and he read it at a YMCA conference where he was speaking, actually preaching back in those days, the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, because of Moody starting that whole movement. And he read that poem and there were two hymn writers there in that same service. And one of them wrote and found the music rather and formed the music for the first part of that poem. And he um, published that, and this, the, the name of that hymn became Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Tell Me the Old, Old Story. And the second hymn writer, both of them, their first names were William, the second hymn writer, he wrote and provided the music for the last part of that stanza, that, that poem of a hundred stanzas. And he uh, wrote the song, or the music to the song, I Love to Tell the Story. And that hymn that we're going to sing right now came out of the heart of that poem of a 30-year-old young woman who was flat on her back in a bed for a year. So um, I invite you to stand if you're able and let's sing. I, I love to tell the story all together, shall we? Oh, 
comes to lead, lead us in the key verse in our invocational prayer. Thank you, brother. What a privilege to be in the presence of the Most High God. There's no greater privilege on the face of this earth on the way to heaven. Our brother later is going to be sharing from John chapter 21, tremendous account, and going to share the whole glorious chapter, but here's just a part of it. Jesus was speaking to Peter, and he said these words. He said, Peter, verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked wherever you would, wherever you wanted. But he said, when you're old, another shall gird you and carry you where you don't want to go. Okay? And then Jesus said, this spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoke this, he said unto him, what we say this morning, follow Jesus. Let's bow in prayer. Father, what a privilege to worship you. What a privilege to praise your name. What a privilege to stand here this morning and know that your word is from heaven. It's given by you. It is forever. It changes hearts and lives. And Lord, we are born again by your holy word. And we pray this morning that the words you spoke to Peter when you said, follow me, Lord Jesus, that every person in this room would hear those words from heaven, from the person of the Holy Spirit, that we must follow you because you are the glorious way. You are the everlasting truth and you are the life and you gave your life in the cross to redeem us. And we stand here this morning, Father, grateful that you shed your holy blood and that you gave your best to redeem us. And we pray this morning, Lord, that your glorious word would have free course in each of our hearts, that it would draw people to the cross where Jesus was honored and glorified in the giving of his life when he honored you by so doing, Father. And this morning in your presence, we just again give you reverence and honor and glory because you are worthy. And Lord, as we sing these songs, we're joining the very host of heaven, the innumerable company of angels, Lord, that are worshiping you and crying, you are worthy. And so, Father, this morning, we say that your holy Son, who is in this place, is worthy of all honor and glory. And to you, Lord, we give thanks for this great redemption. And we pray, Father, in the mighty name of the Son of God, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. 379 is the second hymn that we're going to sing this morning. It too is a prayer, so in a sense we're just extending the prayer that our brother led us in as we even sing this hymn. Take my life, we're singing it to the Lord. Let it be. Let's sing it together.
this uh, this hymn was written by a lady who was a an, an opera performer. And when she read a little book about all for Jesus, she reconsecrated her life. And then at that time, she decided not to sing any opera, not that there's anything wrong with opera, but she committed the rest of her singing uh, to singing about the Lord Jesus. And that's why uh, verse three is especially important for us as, as we sing it together. Let's try verse three together, shall we? Take my voice and let me sing always. sing one more song but and I did not select these hymns but I'll tell you what I was impressed when I uh, saw this next hymn we're going to sing um, maybe you don't know this maybe you do know this but uh, this song stand up stand up for Jesus was written by a young man who had a real uh, passion for ministry to men and to boys and um, he was the pastor's son he pastored a church for a number of years but beyond that, he too was involved with YMCA. And he would arrange and organize mammoth uh, conferences. And uh, the one that is of particular interest this morning to me is the one that he, he had, I guess the, the numbers are that he had 5,000 men and young men and boys and, uh, at, a, at a YMCA conference. And uh, before he stood up, he prayed to the Lord, Lord, Help me to share the gospel so profoundly. And, and if I don't share the gospel, I just, I, I wish my whole right arm would not be a part of my body if I wouldn't share the gospel properly. So help me. Well, the Lord en enabled them. And over a thousand men gave their lives to the Savior that very conference at the YMCA rally. Two weeks later, two weeks later, he was out and they had old corn thrashers that he went to this field and his shirt got caught. He got too close to the thrasher. And his shirt and his right arm got caught. And a tragic thing happened. He lost that whole arm. <laughs> he lost the whole arm. And he never did recover. He was a young man as his father sat by his bedside uh, this young man said to his dad, who was an aged and retired pastor, he said, Dad, just tell the young men, tell all of the men to keep standing up for Jesus. Tell them to just keep standing up for Jesus. Well, at the funeral for that young man, the pastor had heard 
that phrase that uh, this young man said as a dying young man to his dad, and that pastor, it was a Presbyterian church, that pastor wrote, based on what he said, the next hymn that we're going to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And he wrote that based on a funeral service. This is not a funeral service this morning, but it's a service that celebrates people that God calls to be committed to the kingdom of God, whether it's being in a bed of sickness for a year or whether it's losing a limb, but yet nevertheless used for him during some difficult days for the glory of our Savior. So if you're able, I invite you to stand up to sing, and I hope you're all standing up for Jesus. 481, let's sing it.
may be seated. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here this morning on this uh, frosty day. It was the very first frost, and so we were all out on our front porch this morning watching our breath come out because it's something new for this season. So uh, happy first day of frost, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad you're all here. Kids, I'm happy to see you here today. You know, when we were singing one of those songs, it reminded me of a story that we had read at home, and it's probably a story familiar to a lot of you. And I'll tell you what the song part was. It was in that song, Take My Life and Let It Be. And there's a verse in there that talks about silver and gold. Did you notice that verse? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Do you know what a mite is, kids? Show me with your arms. Is a mite this or is a mite this? All right, I don't see much. Show me with your arms, is a mite this or is a mite this? All right, yes, yes, now I'm seeing some of you getting into the spirit of things this morning. I know, we have to warm up, don't we? A mite is this. It's a teeny tiny little bit of something. And that song said, not a mite would I withhold. You know, I think we'd have to, sometimes, sometimes this is what, Maybe, maybe only grown-ups think this. I don't know if kids think this way. I think maybe kids think this way, because when I was a kid, I think I thought this way. I would think that, well, if I only have a very little bit of something, I better keep it in a safe place and not give it away. Because if I give it away, it'll be all gone, and then I'll have nothing left. Do you ever feel that way, kids? Maybe, ooh, maybe I better save my treat this last little bit, I'll just keep it so that it doesn't go away. Or maybe you get some birthday money or some money for a job and you think, ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this. I don't want to give it away. But that's not what we read about in the song, and that's not what we read about in the story. My story was about a little boy, probably about the age of some of you. And he had a mite. It wasn't silver or gold, though. It was fish and bread, different kind of, a different kind of treasure. And he brought it one day because it was his lunch. Kids, it was his. Mom gave it to him. But guess what? He found himself in a big crowd of hungry people. And they were so hungry. And there was a man speaking, and you know who that man was. It was Jesus. And Jesus wanted to feed all of those hungry, hungry people. And so he sent his disciples out and said, Go see what you can find. Now, the Lord Jesus knew about that little boy, and he knew about that mite of a lunch. And what do you think that little boy did? Did he say, well, this is my only lunch. If I give this away to Jesus, what am I going to eat? I'm going to be hungry. Maybe my mom will be mad at me. I better, keep my, I better keep my lunch to myself. Nope. That little boy... Not a mite did he withhold. He gave that little lunch to Jesus. And what did Jesus do with that little tiny bit that was given? Nobody else, I guess, gave anything. There were, and there were thousands of people there. He was the only one that had anything to give. The only one. It's the only one we read about. Jesus took that little mite of a lunch, and he blessed it. And he thanked God for it, and he used that tiny little bit of food to feed everybody. That not enough became more than enough in the hands of Jesus. There were leftovers, lots of leftovers, baskets of leftovers from that little boy's lunch. Kids, let's not hold on to our mites. Grown-ups, let's not hold on to our mites, okay? Or let's not think, oh, my mite is so small, I'm not going to use it. That's embarrassing. Because I think grown-ups think that, too. I don't know if kids do. Sometimes I do. Let's not hold on to our mites. 
let's give them to Jesus. Whether it's silver and gold, or bread and fish, or maybe a gift that he's given to you to use for his honor and glory, give it to Jesus. And that, no way this is not enough. This will never do anything. Will become more than, more than enough to do the work God wants to do. I'm so grateful that Jesus can use our little mites. So let's not hold on to them. Let's give them freely. Okay, kids? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gifts and abilities you've given to us. Thank you for the blessings you've given to us. Help us to be a blessing to others. Like you said to Abraham, you said, I've blessed you to be a blessing to others. So even if the blessings maybe in our eyes do seem small, or they seem like it's not enough, or we're worried that we're not going to have enough, help us, Lord Jesus, to be generous and willing to share, willing to give to you whatever our might might be. And we're going to trust you that you will use that and make it more than enough to do the work that you want to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, I'll see you in Disciple Land. Good morning, church. On behalf of the missions committee, uh, we, I would like to introduce Bera, who is um, one of the missionaries with his wife, Benita, in uh, Thunder Bay. Um, the missions team had the privilege of sending several missions teams up to Thunder Bay to help them in their ministry with the First Nations people. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Bera, and he has offered to help us by reading today's uh, verses from the Bible. So, Bera, I want you to come up now and um, read the scripture and also to share about your ministry in Thunder Bay. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's a great privilege, great honor to be here this morning. Unfortunately, uh, my wife could not join, join us this morning as uh, right now uh, she's at another church at uh, Redeemers. Um, I just want to thank the Lord for this opportunity to come and be with you friends here at Glenridge. And I want to also thank the leadership and the missions committee for arranging this time to be together with you guys. Uh, before we uh, go into the scripture, I will read uh, the whole chapter of John 21 is, is on the bulletin. So we'll, we'll just go through that one quickly before I did a brief report and share a little bit from the word. Well, shall we uh, just commit this time to the Lord and, and ask the Lord for his blessings. Father, we we want to thank you again, Lord, today. Such a, a privilege and honor to be at your house here this morning. Today, uh, many, many people, many churches are offering their time of praise and worship and thanking you for your goodness as we live in a country like Canada and in a city like St. Catherine. We are so blessed to be in a place where we have the privilege to come to church have the privilege to come and worship you. We know that there are other fellow believers in other countries where such gathering like this are not permitted. And so, Father, we just want to thank you. We give you glory and praises for the privilege of coming to you this morning. Lord, as we uh, go into your word, we realize this word is yours. It's, it's holy and it's uh, good for all of us. But you know all of our lives. You know all the situations we go through in our lives. Even as we come to your house this morning, you know all the things we've gone through this week. It's been a hard week for some of us. It's been a good week. And uh, Father, we know 
we come to you this morning realizing that we need you more than anything else in this world. And so we just invite you, Lord God, Holy Spirit, to guide us at this time as we go into you. And make us clean vessels. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed from the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Our sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow has been accounted for. You have paid the price for it. And so, Lord, we do realize, too, as we gather together in your house this morning, we realize, too, that many, many people out there on the streets, out there, wherever they are, are going through difficult times. So may your light, may your face shine on them and help them, Lord, to realize that there is someone who loves them and cares for them. And so, Father, we just thank you again for today. Thank you that you will be with us this morning. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. I do realize it's uh, Easter, Resurrection Day has already come and gone. But I think uh, every now and then it's good to be reminded again of the last word of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, prior to his ascension. According to the scripture, as we're going to be reading, this was the third time that Jesus showed himself before he went up to heaven. You know, sometimes when you are being reminded once, two times, three times to do something, you know, we, we better do something about that. And this was the third time Jesus showed himself, just assuring his friends. Shall we read from the bulletin? After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, who was called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples who were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said, they said to him, we are also coming with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when, they, when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, or in another translation, he says, friends, do you not have any fish to eat? They answered, Sorry, let me go back to the children. Do you not have any fish to eat? Do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find the fish. So they cast it and then when they, when, when they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish, therefore that disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for, for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits away, dragging the, fish full of, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they said, they saw a charcoal fire, already made and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. So Simon Peter went and hauled the net to land full of large fish, 153. And, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to inquire of him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love, do you love me more than this? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, he said to him, Tend my lamps. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know 
that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to put on your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on and bring you where you do not want to go. Now he said this, indicating by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had also leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who is betraying you? So Peter, upon seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is it that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this account went out among the brothers that the disciples would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is it that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying about these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I expect that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. It's, it's an amazing story of what, uh, what happened uh, just, just before Jesus left. Before I share from the word, I just uh, uh, run quickly some of the things that are happening in, uh, at North Wind. It's, it's been a hard week for us, the last this past week at North Wind. Uh, for those of you who've never been to a North Wind or, or Thunder Bay, uh, just want to thank the church too for your continued support over the years. Uh, we always look forward to the team that come from Glenridge to join us and help us. A number of projects, a number of ministry that have taken place in Thunder Bay uh, was done because of the help and financial support from our church here. And I just want to thank you for that. North Wind uh, building right now, as I mentioned, it, it has been a very difficult week for us. Uh, a few years ago, this coming February, we will be celebrating a year of acquiring another uh, building. So right now, we have a couple buildings right in downtown Thunder Bay. Uh, North Wind office building is situated in Thunder Bay, right in the middle of a drug dealing area. Uh, there's been a few deaths this, this few weeks, a uh, number of uh, suicide in the reserves. My wife, Bonita, who is a, a psychotherapist, uh, he has to, she has to go up, I think, two times, a couple times, to a couple reserves. There was uh, some suicide happening in that reserve, so he has to go uh, do some debriefing on the leadership, the chief and council, uh, the medical staff, as well as the responders. Some very, very sad, uh, tragic happens, uh, suicide that have taken place in those, in those communities. So, uh, uh, so she was up there. And we just wanna thank the Lord for the opportunity uh, to, uh, to be up there. And uh, in the midst of difficult situations in Thunder Bay, um, a number of men, number, especially, well, not only the men, even the women too. Uh, you might have heard, I think we've said it here in our church here, uh, quite a while ago, uh, there was an Anglican priest that went up that used to do uh, flying in to some of these communities. The Nishnob Ashki Nation is probably the biggest First Nation tribe in Canada. It has 49, 49 communities, or what they call it, the band. Uh, 49 bands or 49 communities. 
35 of those communities are, are only flying in. The rest you can drive on. But quite a while ago, one of the Anglican priests, his name is Ralph Rowe, who now lives in Vancouver. Uh, he used to be uh, one of the priests that goes up, uh, flies up his airplane there. He was also a Boy Scout leader. So he would, uh, I think, six or eight communities. He sexually abused more than 500 boys. And so some of those boys that he abuses in those times are now living in Zander Bay. And some of them are on the streets right now. So what is happening now, their children and grandchildren are committing suicides in the village. And so we are, we are seeing what is happening now in Zander Bay because of that. And so uh, it's been heartbreaking for us. Uh, last winter, we started uh, what we call in the Bay the warm reprieve where we uh, provide coffee. And uh, I made some Fiji and Banak. I'm originally from the Fiji Islands. Uh, and then we invited them in to come in for one hour or two hours. Uh, some of these guys are coming in. Their hands are shaking in the winter times. And so uh, if there's something that you guys want to pray for, you should pray for them. The shelter house, which houses them only for a night, you know, they come in there, they stay there, and eight o'clock, they are let go, they have to go out on the street. And so they wander around the street all day long and trying to find a warmer place. Some of them sleep outside, even right now, summertime. And sometimes some of these people, when they come out of shelter house or from the street, the first place they go into is North Wind Building, because that's where they get coffee, and that's where they get uh, some of the bannock that I made. And I've taught a few other staff how to make bannock and how to make uh, other, other warm food to help these people. And uh, this last week, uh, well, that was happening even before the COVID. And even COVID, because we were emergency, we were, uh, with the, we were allowed to, uh, to have some of these people on a limited number. Uh, and so they come in, and last week alone, the last few weeks, we've been having uh, probably 40 to 60 people coming in, uh, 20 at a time, you know, to come in. Uh, we scattered them around a little bit because of the COVID, and they've been coming, and, uh, and we have heard a number of comments. There are other agencies, there are other uh, places where they can go uh, get such help, but uh, we have heard many times that coming to Northern Wind was the best place because they can sit and relax. And uh, uh, so on our program, which is called The Next Step, it was the warm reprieve in the winter time, in the spring or in the summer, we call it The Next Step. So it's a place too where we can help some of these uh, street people to make appointments with the doctors because most of them don't have uh, computers or cell uh, so we try to arrange for them to go to the detox centers or make appointments with the doctors. And so it is a place, too, where we can uh, pray with them and talk with them. And, and so now, because of our new building, which we have acquired in February last year, the counseling is on Cross the Street. For those who need it, uh, more uh, intense counseling, then we direct them to our counseling. Uh, North Wind, uh, there's... We have four pillars, four things that we, uh, we emphasize through North Wind. One was uh, the counseling, for those who need counseling. The other one is life build, where we teach uh, the people some life skills. Some of them have been coming to the North Wind gathering, and many of them have mentioned, you know, we have come here, we study the Bible. There's a lot of things we don't know, how to parents. Uh, so, they, so we have a life skill program where we uh, do some programs with some of our staff. They do a life skills program, so on every Tuesday. And the other one is uh, a discipleship or a learning center. Uh, we believe, firmly believe, uh, uh, as part of, the, part of the things we do, we want to help people holistically, not only their spiritual walk with God, but also in their health and other ways of helping them mentally. And so Life Build 
involved in that. And the other one is our land base. Uh, some of our teams from Glen Ridge here have been to Eagles Cove and helping with the development of the fiscal development of the property. We have uh, 182 acres of land with 5,000 feet waterfront. That's where me and my wife, Bonita, we live, we live at the camp right now at Eagles Cove, uh, while the rest of the staff, well, some of our staff live with us too at Eagles Cove. Uh, most of our staff live in town. So that, those are the four pillars of North Wayne uh, discipleship, which is, uh, uh, we have a Bible school that's running now, run by a couple, uh, couple of our staff who are First Nation, some, uh, two, both of them are First Nation. And they do Bible school now. We have students that are coming now to do Bible school. And the other one is Life Build. And the third one is counseling. We have, we have uh, three professional counselors right now with master's degree. And a uh, couple more girls are doing their master's too in counseling. Right now, our clients, uh, it, it's becoming longer. Uh, we have a waiting list for counseling up to a few weeks at a time, even a few months at a time. A number of communities from the north are wanting now more Christian counseling. And, uh, and so that's another thing perhaps our church can pray for. Uh, one of the guys, one of the men that was our counselor, he just left and the thing is, is working somewhere down here. And right now we desperately need uh, two or three more counselors because our waiting list is becoming longer and longer. Uh, if you can just pray for that. We have been so blessed now. We are working in partnership with Health Canada. Uh, Health Canada, uh, one of the communities from the north, uh, contacted Health Canada. We want North Wind. We want Health Canada to fly uh, North Wind staff. Uh, so Health Canada is chartering a flight for North Wind staff uh, every four weeks to go up to the north. Uh, which involved those stuff. Uh, so we've been, I've been, I've gone up on a number of trips. Uh, there's about six of us, uh, three counselors, and a youth worker, children's worker. And, uh, and so uh, uh, while the counselors are engaging in counseling and they make appointments in the village, uh, the youth workers play with the youth. And uh, as well as uh, we go into the school to do a uh, uh, life build with the students in school. So it's working very well. Uh, we do not know how long Health Canada will keep chartering the flight for North Wind. Uh, that's probably another uh, thing we can, you guys can pray for that. Uh, Health Canada doesn't pay for uh, the children's worker and, and the youth worker. They only pay for the professional counselors. And uh, so the, the community have contacted Health Canada telling them we need to have people who can work with the children and work with our youth. Because right now, uh, there's so many suicides. Uh, I, I remember one time, Bonita, my wife went up, uh, there, there was about, it was a packed, packed suicide. The girls, they signed an agreement that they will commit suicide. Uh, they were able, I think one of the girls kind of uh, afraid and tell the leadership what is happening. By that time, two girls from age nine to 14 already died. They commit suicide, they hang them up with, you know, with the, the jacket, you know, the strings of the jacket, that's how they hang them up on the doorknobs. And, uh, and so it, it, yeah, my wife, the first time he went, I mean, he was given more than 20, more than 20 youths, you know, to go and find the youths in that village. Uh, she came back, just like coming back from a war zone. He, she was just so broken. And every time, every time she hears death in the village, uh, yes, she's, she's broken. And, and all of us, it does affect, does affect you. You know, yesterday we were at Redeem, you know, uh, one of the, during question, you know, one of the ladies, how, how do you guys revive yourself? How do you, what, what kind of help do you do? It's, it's pretty dramatic. Especially for my wife, you know, um, 2011, I was diagnosed with, uh, 
with a brain tumor. I still have a brain tumor on my head. I don't have a adre adrenal right now, so I take uh, hydrocortisone. I have a, a malfunction pituitary one. I have a wife that comes home broken like that, and uh, does affect both of us. So we would really value your prayers for both of us. But in the midst of all that is happening, lives are beginning to change. And uh, we would continue to value your prayers. Uh, one of during, you know, one of the questions that was asked yesterday at Redeemer Noah, what, what happened to North Wind during COVID? You know, prior to COVID, we were doing our Sunday gathering. About 60 to 80 people come on a normal Sunday gathering from 4.30 to 7 o'clock. Uh, that stopped when the COVID came. We just opened up again a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we have two, two sessions, two sittings. The, the Sunday gathering contains where people come and have food and they have a, a brief devotion. And then after the brief devotion, we have a meal. And after the meal, for those who wanted to have a longer Bible study, they can stay on. So we start the Bible study from six to seven o'clock. Uh, it's going on very well. and. Uh, and we have a bunch of young people that are helping us now, and so we are so glad. Uh, despite the difficult times in COVID, North Wind grew. Uh, the Lord has been so, so, so good. Uh, we have some grants from the government and some grants from some, uh, some other agencies that we were able to hire a few more young people, very committed, very well educated, and they are helping us. And the past Sundays, uh, me and Bonita, we just let these young people run the Sunday gathering. Uh, and we have uh, continued making contacts uh, with, the, with the low income housing. There's a number of low income housing units in Zander Bay. Uh, so some of these young people are making connections. Uh, during COVID too, uh, prior to COVID, I used to work with a food bank and whatever left over from the food bank, I take it to some of the homes that I know. Uh, but uh, as a result, some of those people, when they got these groceries or these vegetables, some of them don't know what to do with it because they've never seen it, nor do they know how it tastes like. So we develop a program called the Food for Life, whereby our staff, they make uh, they, they, and at first they were doing in class, they come to the Northern building and teach them how to make recipe and how to make it. And during the COVID, uh, they do it on Zoom and, and it's growing. Uh, yeah, the, the people are sharing, are sharing what they learned from the food for life during the food class, even to their relatives in Albert. And so, uh, and sometimes we work together with the gleanings. Uh, uh, some of the people from from here, St. Catherine, uh, we made connections with gleanings, and so some of the food from the gleanings are coming up to, to the Under Bay, which is really good, and uh, um, people, it's expanding. So there's, there's a lot of things that are happening, and uh, I, I, just, I, I just pray and hope that we will continue to work together, as was mentioned before, and uh, uh, such a beautiful thing, despite People are dying in our yard or just next to us. As I mentioned, Northern Building is situated right in the midst of a drug dealing area. You know, people would come and we've seen needles right in our yards. Uh, the city will not pick up our garbage at our garbage at the back if they find needles there. And so, uh, whenever we see a bunch of needles, we call uh, there's a there's an agency that come and collect the needles. And, and so it's, it's very sad. And uh, uh, so we would definitely uh, need your prayers uh, in regard to what is happening. Anyway, that's just about a brief report. I'm rambling really quickly here today. And uh, we'll go into the word. And uh, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, from John chapter 21, it's not a new thing, it's even though it's a resurrection, resurrection day, you have come and gone. Uh, but like I said, it's, I think it's, it's nice, it's good to be reminded. Uh, 
No, do you ever get discouraged in your walk with God? You know, uh, every now and then, you know, when we are not walking closely with God, uh, sometimes, you know, Christian life can become just another routine in our lives. It can become monotonous sometimes if we don't do what we're supposed to do. The disciples went through that time too. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, after living with the disciples for three years, the disciples ate with them, sleep with them. The disciples saw how he prayed, the miracles he did. Then after three years, he was gone. And so on one occasion in the Sea of Tiberias, Peter and the, some, of the, some of the disciples, they were discarded. And so Peter decided, well, I'm going to go fishing, guys. And some of them, yeah, I will go with you. And the Bible talks about that, reads about that. We just read from the, from the scriptures. It was Simon Peter, Nathaniel, and James and John, who is the sons of Sabbath, and two other disciples. As I mentioned earlier, this was the third time he showed himself. Many times, you know, when God is wanting to do something, he sometimes reminds us once, twice, three times. When we are reminded two or three times to do something, whether it be from the word of God or from friends, you know, we should do something about it. You know why? Because we can miss out on what God has for us if we don't take heed of the reminders that is coming our way. The, the text, the, the verse that our key was this morning, you know, when you are young, you know, you dress yourself, you go wherever you want to go. But when you are old, you stretch out your hand, somebody will take your hands, dress you, and take you where you do not want to go. You know, as, as children, you know, we... We, uh, we, we don't have much choices. As parents, we make decisions for our, for our children when they were young. You know, that's one of my problems here. I have four grown-up adults. Sometimes I still want to control them. A loving parent, a loving God will always give decisions, will always give choices to people to make decisions for their lives. When God created Adam and Eve, he did not create them as children. He created them as an adult. They have the power to make decisions for themselves. God could have easily turned the world upside down on his own without the help of mankind. But he gave, he wants us to experience his goodness, his love for us. Because being involved in mission and being involved in the work that God has for us, there is so many blessings. You know, one of the reasons why Glen Ridge is being blessed is because of your involvement in mission work. Every time you come up to Thunder Bay or any time you go out to be involved in mission work, guess what? The blessings of that mission work has repercussions on this church. My friends, when we fail to do that, you know, we are missing the very heart, the very reason why Jesus Christ came. So we look at the life of Nathaniel, we look at the life of the people mentioned on the, on, on the scripture, John 21. Peter, Simon Peter, we all know Peter denied Jesus three times prior to his crucifixion. How many times in our walk with God, even after we come to know the Lord, how many times do we deny who Jesus is? We are no longer living like adults. You know, it's only adults when, when we grow, when we mature in our walk with God, we experience, we see the power of God in our lives. We walk with God on a daily basis. We see how God moves. 
when we are familiar with his ways, when we live a life that pleases him. And many times, as followers of God, we fail to experience God's power because we don't live up to the standard. We deny who Jesus is, just like Peter. All this happened before he ran up, so he was just reminding them. The disciples decided, you know, after being so discouraged and disillusioned, when their master, their Lord, have left them, for 40 days he lived in this world, reassuring his followers, I will come back, I will come back. They were disillusioned. They tried to go back to their old ways, to feast again. For a whole night long, they catch nothing. You know, it's one thing to live as a, to live as a Christian. Or, you know, it's one, thing, it's one way to live prior to you, prior to us coming to know Jesus. It's totally another different lifestyle when we have come and surrendered our life to Jesus. It's a big difference. The disciples decided to do their own thing again prior to the calling of Jesus upon their lives. If you're a businessman, it's one thing to do your business before you came to know Jesus. It's another thing to do your business after you give, you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Big difference. You can either do it your own way, as the disciples did, or do it in the Lord's way. On that early morning, Jesus knew when he stood at the shore, friends, do you have any fish? He knew exactly. They have nothing there. Throw your net on the right side. And all of a sudden they catch fish. You see, that's as, as believers, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how we should live. We depend on the Lord. The, the Lord Jesus himself, without me, you can achieve nothing. You can go back and do any kind of thing. You will not be successful. You may have all the things, you may have all the things this world offers, but there is no peace in it. How do I know that? King Solomon is an example. After all the glory, after all the wealth and all the things he, he had accumulated in his life, at the end of his life he said, what's the use of being alive? What's the use of rich or being poor? At the end of his book on Ecclesiastes, you know, Fear God, for this is the duty of mankind. After all that he accumulated, everything is vanity, nothing. Anybody can have all the things of this world. You can have all the money and all the wealth you have, yet without Jesus Christ in your life, you miss out on the peace of God. And we are living at such a time, it's so challenging. Our young people, our younger generation are facing so many temptations. It's only Jesus Christ who can help. Today, you know, we are blessed. You know, yesterday when we drove around, Carl Jensen took us, I noticed, wow, there's so many churches, big, big buildings. The city of St. Catherine is blessed because of the presence of all these churches. Take all take away all the churches and all the believers who, who know Jesus and love Jesus from this city, and this city will be different. So we have a role as Christians. The land, the city are affected by how people live in it. And so we look at the life of Peter, and Nathaniel, you know, we all know about the Nathaniel. You know, when Jesus called him, when they went and told Nathaniel, we found the Christ, the Savior, Jesus from Nazareth. They took him to Jesus. Jesus said, here comes a, a true Israelite. There's no sin in him. Here comes a true, a true Israelite. Nathaniel Asked Jesus, how do you know about me? Jesus told him, I saw you before Philip 
called you, told you the, the story when you're sitting by that tree. You see, that's a, that's a problem in our society today. People, even amongst us as believers, our lack of knowledge of who Jesus is, our lack of knowledge that the Creator, our God, knows us. He knows where we are sitting, where we are living, what we do in life. He knows all about that. We don't know more about who God is. We are yet to know more about Jesus, what he came for, his power. That, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a big problem in our society today. There's a competition of the world into our hearts. For all the things that is available in our, in our society today, I mean, it's unreal. That's how, if we, are not, if we don't control this, this gadget properly in our lives, it can take the place of Jesus in our heart. Takes away. Our knowledge, we spend more time in the electronics today than reading the word of God. We don't seek God earnestly. And so Nathaniel, when they asked him, we are with, when they told him, we found the Christ. He's from Nazareth. One of his comments is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You see, that's, it represents our attitude too sometimes. Stubbornness, you know, arrogance perhaps. There are some people who don't want to become Christian, don't want to come to church because of attitudes in their lives. Until they run into problem, then they started seeking God. We avoid ourselves a lot of difficult situations if only we learn to know who Jesus is, what, what he, he can do for us. The third and final thing I wanna stress this morning, the two brothers that were there on that morning the sons of Zebedee, James and John. You remember that time? And they were somewhere, the disciples, and this guy's mom came and knelt before Jesus. Jesus asked his, their mom, what do you want? Can, please, you know, in, the king, in your kingdom, can my sons, one of them on the left, one of them on the right, And the Lord told the mom, you know, I mean, it's a typical mom. Any mom, any mom would want the best for her kids. I mean, that's very typical, very natural for a mom. Because she was probably witnessing the power of Jesus. But he wants her sons to be side by side with Jesus. And Jesus told them, you don't know what you're asking for. You see, sometimes... In our walk with God, people, sometimes we can come to church or one come to Jesus with the wrong motives, wrong desire in our hearts. I, I don't want to believe in Jesus until he does this to me. Just like Thomas, you know, when they told him, you know, Jesus rose. No, I won't, I won't believe him until I put my hands on his marks and and the second time he appeared, you know, he called Thomas right away. Put your hand. Put your hand in, put your fingers on my hand. Blessed are those who don't see yet believe. See, that's the uniqueness of walking with God. We don't see. We don't depend on feelings. We don't depend on sight. We live by faith. And that's a problem today in our society today because many people, they don't want to come to church. They don't, don't want to give their life to Jesus because they want to touch it first. They want to see it before they believe. Christian living doesn't work like that. We put our faith in the living God. We, we, we put our faith in his word. Seek it first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will come. 
he knows our needs. And so I want to encourage us today, if there's something I want to leave for you friends here at Glen Ridge. Few things, three things we can learn from just that passage. There's many things we can learn. Three things that are very crucial in our walk with God. First one, to know God, to know Jesus, to know the one who's calling you. When Jesus call, call us, call you, call me, he call you by name, just like he called Peter. Peter, son of John. He knows our dad. He knows our parents. He knows where we come from. He knows the gifts. He knows the talent. He knows what can become of you, what can become of me. It's a high calling. No one, none of us here, when we come to know the Lord, when we become Christian, it was by our own chance. It was God's working in our lives. He was the one who began this walk in us. You know what? Because he knows you from the beginning. Even before you were born, he knew you. It's a high calling. That's the first thing we have to do if we are to be maturing in our walk with God. We have to know who is calling us. Believe in him who is calling us. Second thing, you have to know the heart of God. What he, what he desires, his heart, his purpose. When he showed up, after we told them after they were pulling in the fish, the, the disciples who love him uh, explained and told the disciples, oh, it is Jesus. It takes a loving relationship with Jesus to know what is happening. Sometimes God is working in our, doing miracles in our lives. We don't know that, you know, we don't acknowledge. It, it will take a loving relationship with Jesus to know who is doing miracles in your life. We live by grace, all of us. We live by grace. But have you spent time acknowledging what is done for you, for your family, for your friends? It involves a loving relationship. Second thing is to know the love of God, the heart of God. Psalm chapter 14, verse one, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. See, the heart doesn't speak. The mouth speaks. The heart desires. What's on your heart comes out on your lips. What's on the heart of the mother of James and John comes out in her mouth. One of my sons, can one of my sons sit on your left, one of my sons sit on your right. That was her heart desires. And the third and final thing that we have to learn to know is to know our purposes. Know what we should do. The Lord told Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed, take care of my sheep. It's one thing to know what to do. It's another thing to act on it. Don't fool yourself, James chapter 1, 22, by listening to the word of God, but rather do it. When we learn to live the word of God and act it out and live a life of obedience, oh, we will become like a house being built on the rock. When temptation comes, when difficult time comes in our lives, we remain strong. You know why? Because we are grounded on the word of God. The mission work is a job for all of us as Christians. Today, if you count yourself as a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, the work, you are an ambassador of Christ. The work of bringing people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's your work, that's my work. In, at North Wind, you know, we, it's a fighting game because any given day, people are dying on the street. So we rush, we have to work diligently. We are living right in the middle and today, uh, yeah, you guys have your own thing here too in St. Catherine. People are dying, left, right, center. We are running out against time. And so God, Jesus Christ, I mean, he said too when he was alive, you know, pray for the Lord of the harvest. The harvest are ready. You guys are familiar with the harvest because you have lots of grapes and other things. When harvest comes, you guys are familiar with the harvest. But think of the spiritual harvest. There's so many, so many work to be done and God is calling us and trusting us. May the Lord bless us.
as we move forward in serving him. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barra, for uh, sharing about North Wind, first of all, and the work that uh, you and Benita are doing and being faithful to that mission. And I remember when we were first introduced many years ago to Barra and Benita, and Benita told me, you know, this man that I found in Fiji, or maybe you found Benita, I'm not sure which way it went, but uh, it was so unique and wonderful because Barra, coming from Fiji, is so naturally um, prepared to speak to all of the chiefs in particular in the Northland of, 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 of Ontario now, but uh, all of the First Nations peoples. And uh, Barra has a real giftedness and a real ministry there, uh, particularly with the chiefs and those respective tribes. So we felt it was really important for us as a local church to, uh, to penetrate our own country, some of those needs. And brother, there we have in Thunder Bay, what, a, what an incredible cutting edge place where you are. But you're right, Barra, there are people dying and suicide, the de depression, and all that's happening these days especially. So we need to keep uh, Barra and Benita in our prayers, and especially, and Barra made passing reference to his health conditions with that tumor. And it amazes me, Barra, the way the Lord has been so uh, faithful in sustaining you and to the calling that he's uh, put on your heart and your life. So uh, truly it is an honor for us to uh, to uh, support North Wind Mission. And it's interesting that um, this morning is North Wind, uh, a, a mission that is targeting uh, First Nations people. And, and I saw Rick Osborne uh, walk in the back door, and Rick Osborne here is here along with uh, his dear wife, Heather, and they do the same kind of work. In fact, I think Heather right now, is, uh, as we are here, is, is on a reservation working uh, with some of the First Nations people. And uh, many of us know, of course, the calling of Rick Osborne and uh, Rick and Heather in the work that they do in Port Coburn area, but with uh, troubled teens, and, uh, and then, of course, First Nations people as well. So it's a pleasure and an honor for us as a church to support these, these kinds of missions. What a, what, a, what a wonderful thing to have you with us today. Please express our love and our appreciation uh, to, to uh, dear, your dear wife, Benita. Um, Bob, Pastor Bobby has got uh, a fever this morning, in case you're looking around saying, wonder where are the Halleck's? If some of you know this, the Halleck household has uh, struggled all week long, mom and uh, kids in particular, all week long, and Pastor Bobby was caring for all of the needy little ones and uh, his dear wife. And this morning, we just got a text uh, fairly early in the morning that uh, he has now, Bobby himself has, has a fever. So let's keep... Uh, Pastor Bobby and Laura in our prayers and the whole family as well uh, these, these days. So that's um, why we aren't seeing our pastor with us uh, this morning. I thought I'd mention that. Um, we're going to sing a, a closing hymn. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, Barry, you ended your talk with us this morning about the um, privilege each one of us have. On, and it's important on a mission's Sunday, coming from a missionary, to you to give us this particular message about how each one of us have a wonderful, privileged calling uh, to bring those from a kingdom of darkness uh, to a kingdom of light. Um, the song that we're going to sing in a minute is entitled, Send the Light. Some people say, how are you doing, Pastor Dave, on, on being retired? You know, it's almost been two years now that I've been retired. What do you do? You know. Well, one thing I've been doing is it gives me an opportunity to uh, read about other men's sermons. And I read sermons. And I have a big, thick book that I'm working my way through. It was compiled by Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite Bible teachers. But, of course, Dr. Wiersbe is now... In glory, but but uh, he he pulled together a real thick book, the treasuries of sermons, and, I, and I'm reading these things. And there was a gentleman who lived way back in 1890. His name was Horace Bushnell. Just got through reading his sermon, and it was on. He titled it. It's kind of a strange title, 
unconscious influence. And he wanted to remind his congregation that they are an influence and they might not even be conscious about it. <laughs> because you're an influence when you think you are, when you're saying words that you plan to say or actions that you plan to do, but you're still an influence. And you might not even be aware of it. But people are watching. And the text that he used for that message, Barra, was the text when Jesus was resurrected and Peter, out, or Peter was outrun by John to get to the, the, the tomb to see what was happening. And John didn't enter, but Peter did. And John waited until Peter got there. But then Peter went in and then John followed Peter. I've never heard a message preached on that particular text, but Horace Bushnell, well, that was his text. And he said, Peter wasn't aware of it. But he was that influence on John to bring John closer, closer in to see the place where the Savior was resurrected. So this man that wrote this song that we're going to sing, Send the Light, sometimes we have this idea that we're sitting someplace here and we're sending the light way out there, and that's fine. But the same man, that uh, Charles H. Gabriel, that wrote this song, Send the Light. He also wrote another song entitled, Brighten the Corner, Where You Are. And we're here. And Baron Benita, they're a thousand miles away. But the light of the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and if you're a Christ one, he has indwelled you. The light of the world has indwelled you, so much so that Jesus told his disciples in that wonderful Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world too. To brighten your corner, where you are. Just a closing comment, one phrase from Horace Bushnell's message that jumped out at me. He said, keep in mind, Christians are called light, not lightning. They're called light, not lightning. Little children, and we have four little dogs at home, they can't stand lightning and thunder. Something to be afraid of. But somehow the littlest dog sleeps right through and the sun, glorious sun, comes up quietly and peacefully and provides all that we need. We hardly even know it's there. The heat, the light, and things grow. The power that's in the sun. We are called to be light in who we are because the light of the world indwells us. So can we send the light? Yeah, we can send light because we can brighten the corner, right, where we are. If you're able, let's stand together and sing 307. Send the light. There's a call come ringing, all written for us by Charles H. Gabriel, a man who wrote Bright in the Corner, where you are. There's a call comes ringing for the restless sea. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, and a golden offering at the cross we lay, will send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel Shore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, send the light. 
and the light and the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found send the light send the light send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine from shore to shore send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine from shore to shore let us not Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine. pray together shall we uh, father first of all we want to just thank you this morning for our dear brother that has come to share this morning uh, lord thank you that you are indeed using he and and Benita's wife and all of the people that work as a part of the north wind team you are using them to really draw dear people people that are lost and people that are suffering people that are in depression people that are taking their own lives and people that need to hear about a Savior, Lord, that uh, you are using Bera and Benita and North Wind to draw and invite these dear ones to a kingdom of light to meet a Savior. And so, Lord, we ask for your hand and blessing. Keep uh, Bear strong, Lord. Continue to touch his body and give him all that he needs to fulfill the calling that you have given to him. And we would ask the same for his dear wife, Benita. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless uh, Rick and Heather. And, Lord, that you will continue to use, really, our whole mission family. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being a part, just in a, in a small, small way, to touch the lives of people with the gospel of light. And in that sense, we send it. And, Lord, we want that it would indeed be an of impact across from shore to shore, across this far, far dominion, and in our little way, in our little piece of area and vineyard that you've given to us, we would ask that you will encourage us, Lord. Maybe even there's some people here that might want to talk to Bear or know more, or maybe young people that might be interested to know how to be involved, Lord. We would ask that we would be a people of light that would have a desire to be consecrated fully. And Lord, if there's a place and a location or if there's a way in which we can brighten our own corner where we are right now will you give us hearts and ears to be gentle and hearing the spirit's direction and leading so help us as a church as well we pray so lord we're pleased that uh, we can ask you to be the enabler the director in our hearts and our lives and we would ask lord jesus that you will continue to move in our midst we would ask lord that you would Rest your hand of healing on uh, Pastor Bobby and on Laura and on their family as well. And we would pray, Lord, that you will restore strength and restore health. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of belonging to your family and the kingdom of light here at Glenridge Bible Church. We pray for your benediction on every single person here this day. And we ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you, friends. Have a good and a wonderful day.